This presentation focuses on the classification of decompression disorders as well as the first aid and medical treatment. Now as a refresher, gas bubble disease centers around two physical phenomena. Gas bubble evolution, which is the result of Henry's law causing an increase in dissolved gas tension, after which a reduction in ambient pressure may result in the release of physical bubbles from solution. Secondly, we have the Boyle's law related effect where a enclosed gas will expand under the influence of a reducing ambient pressure and in the case of pulmonary tissues may result in lung overpressure injury. Based on these two mechanisms, there are two clinical categories or clinical conditions that have respectively been called decompression sickness and arterial gas embolism. In terms of classifying these conditions for the purposes of treatment and proper clinical documentation, there has been some confusion. Firstly, for practical purposes, both arterial gas embolism and decompression sickness are treated largely in the same way – oxygen, fluids and recompression. There are some modifications and areas of greater emphasis or concern, but largely the conditions are treated in the same way. And therefore, from a practical standpoint, the distinction between the two conditions is somewhat artificial. Secondly, as already has been made clear in earlier lectures, there are ways in which venous gas emboli, as a result of decompression, may enter the arterial circulation and cause manifestations that would appear identical to arterial gas embolism. In other words, decompression sickness may give rise to symptoms that would be attributed to arterial gas embolism. Conversely, there are situations in which lung overpressure injuries may result in gas entry into the circulation causing transient symptoms of arterial gas embolism followed by manifestations that are clearly the result of spinal decompression sickness, so-called type 3 decompression sickness. Because of this crossover, it therefore becomes very difficult to maintain clear watertight compartments between these two conditions. The confusion that has arisen around this is evidenced by the two prevailing classification systems. The first, which we might call the pathological classification system, promulgated by Golding in 1960, tries to differentiate between decompression sickness and arterial gas embolism as the root cause. For the most part, it is not particularly helpful in the clinical management of these disorders, simply because all the information is rarely available at the time that clinical decisions need to be made. Nevertheless, for the sake of completeness, let's just briefly touch on the difference between the classifications. The Golding classification separates into decompression sickness, arterial gas embolism and barotrauma. Decompression sickness, in turn, is divided into so-called type 1 or mild decompression sickness, which typically would either be a skin rash or constitutional tiredness or isolated joint pain, but not girdle pain. Type 2 decompression sickness represents pretty much all the other manifestations, including cardiopulmonary decompression sickness, or the chokes, and decompression shock. It may include audiovestibular symptoms, as well as neurological symptoms. Type 3 decompression sickness is a mixed form that commences with manifestations that would be associated with arterial gas embolism, disturbances of consciousness and so on, followed by a very resistant form of spinal cord decompression sickness. Arterial gas embolism here is the result of pulmonary barotrauma and the respective forms of barotrauma in the various organ systems that would be affected are classified separately. Dysbaric illness or decompression illness is a more useful clinical category because it makes provision for the changing nature of the condition 
and also the relative level of severity over time. The classification pivots largely on two central components, the so-called evolution and manifestation. The evolution, in other words, the way in which symptoms develop, may either be progressive, which is the assumption at the first assessment, because at some stage the person was normal, and on this particular assessment they are found to be abnormal, and hence the condition has progressed from a state of being normal to whatever the abnormal findings are. Subsequently, however, the findings may suggest that the condition has stabilized, in which case it would be static. It may, on the other hand, actually improve, in which case it would be called improving. Or, after having improved, or to some extent being alleviated, the condition and the manifestations may start to recur or relapse, in which case the description relapsing would be used. The second component is the system or part of the body that's affected, and these, relatively simplistically, are categorized as neurological, cardiopulmonary, limb pain, girdle pain, lymphocutaneous, or vestibular. Modifiers that sometimes help in both determining the more likely cause of the gas bubble disease, as well as the prognostic or predictive factors, both in terms of likelihood to response to the therapies that are provided, as well as the chances of subsequent deterioration, are associated with the time of onset, inert gas burden, and whether or not there's evidence of barotrauma. Time of onset is relevant in that very, very rapid onset is more likely to be as a result of arterial gas embolism, whether through pulmonary barotrauma or venous gas, whereas delayed onset almost inevitably would be decompression sickness related. The inert gas burden suggests the extent to which the person has dived or been exposed outside the parameters that would be considered safe. In other words, whether the person violated the decompression profile or dive tables. A low gas burden would be considered a no decompression dive completed according to a table. Medium gas burden would suggest a completed set of decompression stops whereas high would be related to a violation of the decompression algorithm, table, or schedule. Evidence of barotrauma theoretically could include other organs, but largely is required in terms of pulmonary manifestations of barotrauma, the idea being that one would, to a greater or lesser extent, be able to rule out or exclude uh, pulmonary overexpansion as a cause of the bubble-related phenomena. Now, to make this a little bit more real, we would like to show you three cases, vignettes acted out, obviously exaggerated to prove the points, that will allow you to classify the decompression illness for the purposes of description. Stuart! Yeah, how was your dive? Oh, good away, my buddy! I don't know if I found my third, I couldn't stay down, I've missed all my decompression. All of it? Oh, that's 40, I think I was at 40 meters off. Okay. But, uh, Are you okay? No, no okay. I always, I always... Oh. Okay, can you get off? Can you walk okay? Yeah. Just go off. In this particular case, the individual starts by describing that he doesn't know where his buddy is, that there were problems with the power inflator, missed all the decompression that was required from a significant depth of 40 meters, and has subsequently, with relatively rapid onset, developed pain in the elbow and a skin rash. Using the Francis classification, if communicating this condition 
to a diving physician or making a note in the chart, it would be described as acute progressive limb pain and lymphocutaneous decompression illness with a short time of onset, high gas burden and no evidence of barotrauma. Hi. Hi. How was your dive? I was good. I was down for a long time. Eh? Did you go deep? Yeah, about 40. Wow, oh, that's pretty deep there. This leg What's doesn't wrong? feel right. It's like pins and needles. It's going a bit low. No, that's not good. Gee, this is weird. My arm as well. Oh, no, that's not good. Have a lie down, perhaps. Hang on. I think I'm going to be sick. I can't see properly. Oh. We see that the person was down for a long time to a significant depth of 40 meters, starts developing tingling in the left leg, followed by weakness in the left leg and arm, visual problems and nausea, collapse, and loss of consciousness. In this case, it would be described as acute, progressive, neurological, cardiopulmonary, and vestibular decompression illness occurring shortly after surfacing with a high gas burden and no evidence of pulmonary barotrauma. This last case is relatively dramatic. <laughs> and shows a person rapidly surfacing from an unknown depth, crying out as the gas from the lungs is released, immediately collapsing at the surface and being unresponsive, coughing up blood and being of suppressed consciousness. In this case, one would describe it as acute, progressive, neurological and cardiopulmonary decompression illness occurring immediately upon surfacing with an unknown gas burden with evidence of lung overpressure injury or pulmonary barotrauma. Now that we've completed the classification, let's consider how we would apply that in the setting of emergency and medical treatment. First of all, depending on where the diver is at the time that they are incapacitated or start manifesting potential signs and symptoms of decompression illness, there may be some logistical, practical and even life-saving measures to be considered. It may happen underwater, the person may lose their regulator, there may be a seizure, the person may lose consciousness at the surface, it may happen during a swim to shore, and all these would have implications in terms of rescue and, of course, ultimately treatment. There are four aspects that were largely covered in the classification system that would assist in determining the probability of a particular problem and manifestation being decompression related. We will discuss them in turn. And the first one, whether there's reason to suspect, in other words, whether there is any true probability that this is decompression illness. Secondly, whether there is actually evidence of injury. Thirdly, whether there is a neurological abnormality. And then fourthly, from a more operational level, what options and what the best life-saving, stabilizing and ultimately therapeutic options would be. To take them in turn, the suspicion of decompression illness is greatest when there is acute onset, which for the most part would be within six to eight hours, and on the outside 48 hours with altitude exposure, when there was actual exposure to compressed gas or a compressed gas source in excess of 1.4 meters in order to be able to get lung overpressure injury, or at a significant exposure to six to eight meters and beyond for decompression sickness to occur. Most commonly, dives greater than 24 meters or 80 feet are associated with decompression sickness. The inert gas burden was the exposure in terms of depth and time compatible with a probability of decompression illness. Fourth, were there obvious errors or risk factors? And finally, do we have another potential cause to consider? Ranging from a heart attack to hazardous marine life envenomation, for instance. Now, decompression illness is more probable when diving at altitude, exercising after the dive, uh, 
having previous injuries in the area that's affected, missing decompression stops, having a rapid, uncontrolled ascent, following a profile that is undulating, in other words, a lot of ups and downs, having a greater amount of physical unfitness and possible body mass, having had previous dives or previous exposure, and being dehydrated, skip breathing, and cold. These are additional aggravating factors that may increase the chances of developing decompression illness. Was there evidence of injury? Here one would look at physical abnormalities, whether they are rash or weakness and loss of consciousness. Evidence of barotrauma, being it bleeding from the mouth or bleeding from the ear. And the complaints and clinical presentation, which we could call the symptoms. So basically, the evidence of injury rests on the signs, the symptoms, evidence of barotrauma, and the history. In terms of neurological abnormality, this mnemonic, which is associated with the five-minute neurological assessment, focuses on the mental state, function of the eyes, face, ears, and then the strength, mobility, and sensation in the upper limbs, cranial nerves, including the throat, the tongue, various muscle groups, sensation throughout the body, balance and coordination, and ultimately bowel and bladder function. The latter is commonly forgotten or neglected and should be emphasized. With this in mind, one then needs to decide on what the appropriate treatment would be. So we've got suspicion, there's evidence of injury, there may or may not be neurological abnormality, and we are now deciding or considering the options for decompression treatment. And here, the focus initially is recognizing the symptoms, responding with oxygen, communicating with whatever resources are available to assist in either stabilizing, treating, evacuating, or ultimately recompressing the individual. And finally, whatever options are there to increase the probability and reduce the time or delay until recompression treatment may be commenced. Obviously, maintaining life is the most significant priority, so airway breathing circulation is first. 100% oxygen is then provided, preferably either by a demand valve or a non-rebreather mask at 15 liters a minute, or if the person is not breathing, with either a pocket mask, bag valve mask, or even intubated via an endotracheal tube. The position is preferably in the, with a person supine, legs raised if there is shock, and if they are breathing spontaneously on the left lateral side to minimize the chances of breathing in stomach contents and to some extent to favor the elimination of bubbles from the heart to the lungs. Fluids, usually from a medical sense, this would be intravenous, and saline, ringers, or if the person is in complete control of their uh, airway, they might be able to drink isotonic fluids. And in the first hour, one attempts to increase the volume of the body by about one to two liters. Obviously, if the person takes it orally, one needs to be careful that the person's consciousness is uh, in place and that there's no risk to the airway or aspiration of stomach contents. After the initial bolus or pulse of fluid, one tries to maintain urine output to the extent of 2 milliliters per kilogram per hour. So a 100 kilogram person should eliminate approximately a cupful of urine every hour. The treatments that are actually recommended, in other words, based on science, in the treatment of decompression illness include surface oxygen, and here one would continue to at least six hours if recompression is to be commenced relatively soon, or as long as 16 hours continuously if recompression treatment will be delayed more than 24 hours. Hydration, which was just described, recompression to 18 meters, which is covered in another lecture, prevention of overheating, which aggravates neurological problems, avoidance of high glucose levels, which also aggravates neurological problems, and avoiding of deep 
venous thrombosis by using anticoagulants carefully under medical supervision in cases of paralysis and spinal cord decompression problems. Agents that might be helpful in selected cases and might be employed under the supervision of a diving physician could be a heart medicine called lidocaine or lignocaine as well as anti-inflammatory drugs. What has not been proven to be of value is high doses of cortisone and complete anticoagulation. In the future there may be other agents including brain protective agents and nitrogen elimination, oxygen enhancing uh, medications. In terms of reporting and recording the history, clearly the depth time exposure, the decompression and stop schedule, repetitive or previous dives and problems, anything that happened during the dive that was untoward, and clearly whatever may have affected the dive buddy or other members of the dive group that would probably have been subject to the same type of exposure. The goal, if all things are equal, would be to get the diver to a recompression facility within less than four hours. Usually it's either denial by the diver of their symptoms or transport issues to get a diver to a chamber that results in delays longer than this. If a diver is to be flown in an aircraft, every effort is made to avoid decompression greater than a thousand foot above whatever altitude the injury occurred. At sea level, one would then try to limit the altitude to a thousand feet. This is typically important within the first 24 hours. If the person was diving at altitude, then the cabin altitude could increase to a thousand foot above whatever that was. Lastly, it's important to monitor the buddy and, in the case of a diving fatality or serious accident, to impound the equipment to turn off the uh, pillar valve of the diving cylinder and to leave it subject to further investigation. Recompression treatment is the ultimate treatment and we've discussed the implications related to that. For the most part though, the errors that are made in managing decompression illness is when the diagnosis is not made, when a pneumothorax is not identified, or when low blood glucose is not recognized as being the cause of the disruption of consciousness. When in doubt, recompress, and of course, we are still in a learning process. And therefore, perhaps cynically one might say, as a medical school professor once did, half of what we taught you is wrong. Unfortunately, we don't know which half. However, and perhaps more confidently, we can say that for the moment, this is the state-of-the-art information.